Big District Court for County of Washington, State of Michigan, kind of session on the kind of business. You may be seated. Oh, we got a problem. Yeah, we do. Because it's just that kind of day. Okay, I'm good. Um, there on my desk. Court does call the case People's State of Michigan versus Isaiah Williams. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Danny Woodson. Good afternoon, Alex Peterson, on behalf of the people. And good afternoon, Your Honor. Danny and Woodson, on behalf of Mr. Williams, who is appearing live from the Washington County Jail. Yes, he is here, and so that the record is clear. Um, during yesterday's proceedings, Mr. Williams was here, tried to leave, did not. He stayed through the entirety of yesterday's proceedings. Today, shortly before the time at which these proceedings were to begin, the court was informed that Mr. Williams refused to come from come up from his cell. So the Washington County Jail has been wonderful in making an accommodation. And so the court could elect not to have him here and present at all, in, in essence, forfeiting his right to be present in the courtroom. However, um, the Washington County Jail has provided a tablet with the use of technology. Mr. Williams can hear. And if he does turn himself around, he would also be able to see the proceedings as they are going on. Um, so he is effectively participating. What we will be doing is we will be muting him so that he cannot speak back and disrupt the proceedings. But if it looks like he's going to say something, I'd ask the um, deputies in the Washington County Jail that if he does try to say something, if you could let us know so that we could address whatever issue he may have at that moment, if it's relevant to any of the proceedings. So. Having said that, is there any objection given the circumstances to proceeding in this fashion from the people? None from the people, yes, sir. Any objection from defense? Uh, none from defense, Your Honor. I would just ask if one of those moments does happen where he needs to communicate with me, that I'd be allowed to excuse myself to just log on to Zoom. We, we will certainly, if he wishes to communicate with you, we will certainly attempt to try to accommodate that the best that we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we had concluded with the last witness, unless there's anything else preliminary. People were still in their case. You may call your next witness. The people next call Inspector Sarah Preston. And if you could please come forward and be sworn. Seat raiser right now. You saw him swear firm the testimony you're about to give. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So you got. Have a seat. State your first and last name and spell it for the record. Dr. Sarah S A R A H Krebs K R E B S. You may inquire. Thank you, Judge uh, Inspector Krebs. Where are you employed? Employed with the Michigan State Police. How long have you been with the Michigan State Police? This will be my twenty-third year. And is there any specific division or unit that you are currently assigned to? I'm currently the Chief Diversity Equity Education Officer for the Michigan State Police, formally assigned to the Missing Persons Unit. Okay. As uh, an inspector or an officer that's assigned to the Missing Persons Unit, what would your job duties include? Uh, when I was in the Missing Persons Unit, we um, were a missing persons clearinghouse and unidentified remains clearinghouse for the state of Michigan. And so we investigated both um, missing person cases and unidentified remains cases to try to find a resolution to these. How long were you part of this missing persons unit? From 2014 until 2019 when I promoted out. As far as the case that we are here for today, did you have some involvement as far as being involved with the missing persons unit for a Olissa Williams date of birth, 8 10 1981. Yes. Can you tell me how it is that you became involved with this particular case? Detective Iverson from the Ann Arbor Police Department uh, contacted me um, and wanted to know if we had any unidentified remains cases that uh, could be Olissa Williams. 
um, asked me to kind of do a, um, a clearinghouse check on her case to see if you know we thought there were any remains in Michigan or even nationally that we um, thought could be her or any you know child abduction uh, abduction cases um, that we're currently investigating. So I did a scan back then on all the databases that we um, check for any cases that matched her and none matched at that time. And then I did that again yesterday. I checked um, the same three databases to make sure in the gaps since I left until um, the trial today, to make sure that there were no other cases and there were none. Before we talk about those three different databases, you left the missing persons unit in 2019, correct? So is 2019, am I fair in believing in 2019, that was the first time you had checked for the Olisa remains, or was it before that? It was before that. Okay. I believe it was sometime probably in 2016 that I did the initial check. And as far as this clearinghouse check, I think you indicated you did another one yesterday evening before testifying here today. Is that correct? Let's talk about these three different databases. Can you tell me what uh, one of these databases are that you checked? One is NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center. Uh, records are held by the FBI. It includes uh, both missing persons and unidentified remains records. Did you check the NCIS? Yes. Okay. And NCIC. And I, NCIC. And in terms of... In terms of checking it or doing a, as you said, a clearinghouse check, um, did anything um, in your check come up as identifying as matched to Alyssa Williams? No, ma'am. Okay. Let's talk about another database that you checked. Another database is the NAVIS database, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. It's run by DOJ and NIJ. It's an online database. It's a a uh, more relevant database for unidentified remains than missing persons. Tell us why it's more relevant. Uh, well, it has more records in the system than NCIC has for unidentified remains. And that is because a lot of medical examiners who uh, have the burden of identification in most unidentified remains cases don't have access to NCIC. Okay. So they use names instead. And in terms of... Um, NamUs, do you do have, have you yourself done any work in um, putting a backfilling or putting cases into that particular database? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I was uh, appointed back in 2007 as um, one of the state experts for NamUs to start backfilling records into it. Um, NamUs was a new database at that point. It is a publicly accessible internet-based database. Um, so when we were starting out back in 2007, we had to uh, manually enter all of the both missing and unidentified cases in it. So um, I started researching unidentified remains cases within the state of Michigan and hand entering them into that system. So um, upon yesterday's check, we have 334 cases of unidentified remains. Were there any particular cases that came up in your search that you... Um, cross-checked or referenced against Alyssa Williams' case? Uh, well, in this case, this is a, a juvenile child, so that uh, will exclude most of the cases because most of them are going to be adults in, in this system. Uh, there were only seven juvenile cases entered into NamUs presently, and then I was able to go through all seven of those and exclude them individually. And so in excluding each of the seven cases, uh, I'm would I be correct in saying not one of those cases has come back as um, being identified as the remains of Alyssa Williams? Correct. Let's talk about the third da database that you've mentioned that you checked in and, and checking for the unidentified remains of Alyssa Williams. What is that database? The third database would be the National Center for Missing Exploited Children's Database. Um, so the Michigan State Police we serve as the Missing Children's Clearing House for Michigan, being we are the sole liaison of the National Center. Yeah. State of Michigan, all the records. Um, I checked with the case manager that oversees Lisa Williams' case, which is a current case with the National Center. She's still considered a missing child. And um, just made sure that there were no um, pending investigations or cases that we were looking into. There were two um, cases that were cleared recently by DNA. 
uh, that people had um, tipped to Nickman. Okay. And uh, both of those were, were cleared by DNA. So no pending cases for the case manager. And I think the acronym you used was NICMIC? Okay. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. When you say in, in terms of after 41 years in that particular database, her case is still active as a missing child. Is it fair to say those cases remain active until remains are found? Yes. Okay. Do you, um, is there DNA also on file on a national database in terms of uh, trying to identify remains for Alyssa Williams? Yes, and we have DNA from uh, Alyssa Williams' biological mother. It is in the CODIS database by DNA. It's running at the national level. Can you explain a little bit if people aren't familiar what, what CODIS actually is? Uh, so if we take DNA from a family relative of a missing person, like Elisa's mother, um, her DNA would be profiled and it would be uploaded into the computer system that profiles that DNA and tries to match it to other cases. So um, her DNA is entered as a family reference sample in the CODIS system. That file in CODIS will search against the unidentified remains database, crime scene databases, all the other parts of CODIS to try to come up with a match. And as of today, there is no match. So between 2016 and, and as recently as yesterday evening, has your uh, work as, as part of the missing persons unit identified any unidentified remains either locally in the state or nationally been identified as that belonging to Olisa Williams? No. Okay. One moment. No further questions. Thank you. All right. Cross-examination. Just very briefly, Ron. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So is it fair to say that if you are not dead or if you don't recognize that you are in fact missing, you would not be in any of these databases? Uh, it would depend if you volunteer your DNA mm -hmm. or if you have an reference sample, you would be in CODIS. Okay, let's. I'm sorry. Assuming I didn't, I didn't, I didn't volunteer any of my DNA. I'm not um, missing, and I don't have any remains. I would not be in the system, correct? Correct. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. All right, me. Inspector. Thank you. May call your next witness. People call Holly What are they doing down there? Okay. And please move forward, be sworn. We'll have a seat and state your first and last name and spell it for the record, please. Holly Rosen, H O L L Y R O S P N. Thank you. May inquire. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Rosen, can you tell me how you are currently employed? Yes, I'm employed at Michigan State University and MSC State Place, which is a domestic violence program. And in what capacity do you work for MSU Safe Place? I'm director. Do you uh, hold out any other uh, uh, jobs? Well, the job as a director includes supervising all of the program, the staffing, the finances, the outreach, grant writing, that kind of thing. But in addition, I do expert witness testimony, and I'm on, I sit on various boards and professional groups. Um, how long have you been with MSU Safe Place? I've been there since the program started in 1994. And prior to that, I worked for 13 years at End Violent Encounters, which is a licensing program. It used to be called the Council Against Domestic Assault. So I've been doing this work for 42 years since 1980. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your educational background? Yes, so I obtained a bachelor's in social work from Michigan State University um, in 1981. And then I um, obtained a uh, master's in social work also from Michigan State University. As far as um, other sorts of training in terms of uh, for your background in working for MSU Place, uh, MSU Safe Place, excuse me, what kind of training and experience do you have uh, becoming the director for MSU Safe Place? Well, I'm a licensed social worker with the state, so I have to get um, continuing education every year, um, in addition to the 15 CEUs or credits that are needed every year. I also attend a lot of other webinars and Conferences. You mentioned um, being an expert witness, but do you also train other other professionals in the field? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So for years, um, when I first started doing expert witness testimony in 2001, um, I worked with the Prosecuting Attorney Association of Michigan to train prosecutors across the state. I did this for many years um, on how to utilize experts. I also am faculty, have been faculty for PAM for other programs as well like teaching prosecutors how to um, look for signs for domestic violence homicides and how to prosecute those kind of cases. And I've been faculty for the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence to teach new service providers about various topics. Um, in addition, I've trained law enforcement, um, different attorneys, defense attorneys, counselors or therapists, and different service providers locally as in the Lansing area, as well as statewide. As far as you did mention, testifying as an expert witness. Have you been qualified in court as an expert witness? Yes, I have. About how many times, if you know? As of yesterday, 100 times, 62 times for prosecution, 23 times for family cases, and 15 times for the defense. Okay. Um, may I approach your honor? You may. Ms. Rosen, I'm approaching with a four-page document, document, excuse me, People's Proposal 59. Do you recognize this document? I do. What is that? That's my CV. Okay. Um, and this, does this reflect your educational background, employment background, and, and the like? It's essentially a very, very um, detailed resume, essentially, correct? Okay. I'd ask that People's 59 be admitted into Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Governor Wardier. No objection, for example. 59 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Ms. Rosen, how, in terms of you being qualified this many times as an expert, is there a specific area of expertise you've been qualified as an expert in? Yes, in domestic violence and sexual assault cases, as well as trauma, to explain you know, non-intuitive victim response, perpetrator tactics, context, and other factors related. Your Honor, at this time, I'll, I'll turn over to Wadir to counsel in terms of qualifications for Ms. Rosen before I ask for her to be. Your Honor, for okay. purposes only, I'll stipulate your expertise. All right. Thank Stipulating you. Stipulating to the, okay. And again, if she, I had asked if she qualified in the wide variety of what she outlined um, in her testimony, specifically domestic violence, sexual assault, trauma dynamics, Your Honor. She is an expert. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Rosen, did you have an opportunity to review the case materials that we are here for in terms of Alyssa Williams and her mom, Denise? Statements, police reports, um, timeline chronology, and the like. Yes. Did you also have an opportunity to meet with me a couple times and discuss some of the factors and the facts in the case? Yes. Okay. You mentioned working 42 years, I think it was. I mean, if my math is wrong, I apologize. With survivors interacting with domestic violence perpetrators, correct? correct. I think you said since 1981. Okay. Um, you also have experience, you mentioned training service providers about these particular, uh, what we would call perpetrator tactics, correct? That's correct? Okay. Can you explain for the court what you would qualify or what you would define as perpetrator tactics when we're talking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence? So it's any, any tactics or behaviors that are used by someone who is selecting, grooming, or abusing somebody that they are targeting. Are all perpetrator tactics going to be exactly the same case to case, or do they do they vary? They vary. Okay. When you are providing this training to other service providers, um, are children ever part of the equation that you, you factor in when looking at particular perpetrator tactics? Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about more about that? 
Yeah, so children are often used during a relationship that is abusive, and they often are used um, post separation after um, a victim and the abuser break up their relationship. So the children are used in a lot of different ways to punish and control uh, the adult victim. What kind of situations in your experience dealing? Well, let me ask this right like that. You have dealt with the practical side of domestic violence and the academic side. Is that fair to say? By practical, you mean real life yes. survivors and the academics. Yeah. Yes. You've worked in the shelter setting. You've worked in the academic setting, correct? Yes. In terms of, of working um, in, in sort of the real life setting, um, what kind of situations have you seen in your experience where an abuser might use children to quote unquote punish the the adult person in the relationship. So abusers often will use children or pets and or pets um, to control the victim, to threaten to take the children or to take the children, for instance, if the um, victim is attempting to leave the relationship, um, they might uh, use or um, neglect the children or take the children to um, make sure that the victim does not feel intimidated and worried and worry about their children's safety in terms of um, child support um, or other issues. So it's often related to the relationship, child support, or arrest, calling the police on them and prosecuting. So using children to dominate and control the victim because a lot of victims are very concerned about the safety of their children. They can take a lot of abuse themselves, but when the children are threatened, um, that's a, a successful way to dominate and control. And is, is successful ways in dominating and controlling the victim, is that similar to how you would talk about tactics of using the children as leverage? Yes. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the acts of strangulation, if we could. Uh, did you, in, in reviewing the discovery, read some allegations of strangulation to multiple people that are involved in this case? Okay. Um, did you read it as involved to an ex-girlfriend and as to the mother of, of Olisa in this case? Let me ask about the term strangulation versus choking. In your expertise, is there a difference? Is it a different terminology? H help me understand that. Yeah, so choking is when food or some other object is lodged in one's throat. And so there's a gagging or choking reaction. Um, you know, it can occur with sexual assault when there's a forced object or penis, for instance, in the, but it's usually food that gets lodged in the throat. Um, then there's strangulation, which is putting pressure on one's neck and uh, that's not oxygen. That can be done with a hand, with a leg, with ropes, with anything that restricts the um, ability to get oxygen. And that is very dangerous, resulting in either death, near death, or anything. Um, then there's suffocation, which is covering the mouth and the nose. Um, at the same time, so some people typically confuse strangulation and choking. Um, they uh, maybe use the word choke, a uh, hold perhaps, but people, especially victims, usually use the language choking when referring to what they've experienced. Um, Have you found that in your experience dealing with survivors in, in shelters and, and the like, uh, that survivors will talk to you about being choked by their perpetrator versus strangled? Yes. Is strangled more often used as a legal term? Yes. Okay. In terms of you reviewing the documents in this case with the ex-girlfriend, Mary, is that the name you recall? Yes. Okay. Mary in, making some statements that the defendant made to her during a strangulation episode. Do you recall reviewing that? Is there any uh, significance in your mind based on your expertise to statements being made like this during a strangulation episode? So often when abusers strangle victims, whether it's in a domestic violence assault or sexual assault, um, Survivors often report that abusers are also verbally telling them ways that they should be interpreted. Um, so they literally are holding the victim's life in their hands, um, which is terrifying enough. But many times, abusers will also tell victims, I can kill you, or I can kill you later, or I killed other people before. So there's lots of ways that um, abusers will add additional comments to the strangulation experience. Um, and that escalates or um, increases the terror experience. You mentioned being in this field dating back to, I think, 1981. Have you seen a change in the way law enforcement and survivor advocacy groups um, deal with strangulation in the 80s 
versus today, even the seventies, if based on your, your research, um, versus the way we handle those kind of cases today. Yeah. So, um, Shelters started in the late 70s, early 80s in the United States. Um, I started working in the At that time, the shelter programs that I knew of, and I went to the state wide coalitions, never asked about strangulation as a screening tool when the shelter takes. And the same was true law enforcement, because we were review a lot of police reports and work closely with law enforcement and prosecution. In the past, in 15 years, there's been an increase of awareness about strangulation being tied to the house homicides or fatality and that a lot of local law law enforcement entities, not just in Michigan, but across the, the country are now screening routinely for strangulation. And I know that a lot of domestic violence programs are encouraged to do that as well. In terms of your work, have you, we talked already about batterer tactics and, and the commonality of using children as leverage. Um, have you worked with a lot of quote unquote parental kidnapping cases and cases where children have been used in that manner? So I've, I've you know, worked with thousands, 5,000 domestic violence survivors since 1981. Um, and I would say that I have, I'm aware of many cases under 100 yeah. um, cases involving kidnapping at some point of either the parent and the children or the children. When there's an allegation of domestic violence occurring in a relationship, can you can you talk about or address children being conceived outside a relationship and, and any potential risk factors that you've seen in that particular relationship? So there's a danger assessment scale um, where people can be trained on doing um, assessments with survivors to determine their lethality and one of the factors is having a child outside of the abusive relationship because abusers like to be the center of attention they like to be in control and if their children from a past relationship they often treat those children differently with more abuse or neglect or using them as leverage more um, the children they might physically have in common with and then the children are conceived during the time that um, someone has left an abusive relationship, it is typically with an abusive relationship. People come and go many, many times. If they, if the child is conceived in between that time while they've left and they are still then getting together with the abuser in the future, um, abusers often will target those children. Um, you know, that's also a legality factor in terms of the children. In terms of specifically not just children, but child abuse, in your work, have you seen any sort of correlation between domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and child abuse? Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so domestic violence, um, you know, is one adult abusing another, but the children also are affected and impacted and they are exposed to domestic violence. And even if they are never abused or neglected, they experience trauma. But many times children are also um, harmed you know, accidentally or intentionally by the abuser as a way to, again, punish or control um, the victim or just because they don't have patience and they are terribly terrified. So there's lots of reasons why it's uh, child abuse is highly correlated with domestic violence. You've talked a couple times about the the term lethality. Is there something called lethality factors or lethality assessment? I'm not sure if I'm using the term right. Yeah, so there's lethality factors. And that's tied to the research um, from John Hopkins School of Nursing um, that was done many years ago has created a danger assessment scale or danger certification scale, Dr. Jackson. And there's many reality factors, and some of them are weighed more heavily than others in the Um are, are threats of homicide or suicide part of those factors? That is one of um, are access or use of firearms part of that? What about um, isolating in terms of isolating from friends or family, moving moving people up to other locations? That is a um, uh, domestic violence tactic. Um, it's not necessarily in the legality factors, but it is a tactic that is related to why victims often stay in the is sexual abuse also part of uh, the lethal, excuse me lethality factor assessment? Yes. Okay. You mentioned already pet abuse. Um, what about extreme jealousy? Yes, that is. Rage. That's a abuse tactic. Okay. 
we've already talked about strangulation. Would you consider that in your work part of a one of the lethality factors? It's not, not my decision to evaluate that by myself. Yeah. Okay. One of the okay. Is drug and alcohol consumption um, part of what in in your field they consider a lethality factor? It is way less than some of the other factors, but it is a lethality. You've already talked about um, children, children outside the relationship. Um, what about separation of the relationship when a partner chooses to leave the abusive partner? Is that part of the lethality factors? It is actually dangerous. Is when they leave the abusive relationship. In my field, it's called separation violence, and that's where um, the risk for lethality increases at the time a victim leaves the abusive relationship. And the domestic violence homicide risks are either for the victim, for the victim's children, for the victim's partner, or for other victims, or for strangers too. Okay. The effects of trauma, uh, you already talked a little bit about children, even when they're not abused specifically in the intimate partner relationship, they can take on the effects of trauma. Um, the effects of trauma, is there a standard period of time that that lasts for a particular person who's abused? No, there's no way to know if someone is exposed to a certain experience, whether they will have trauma and how long it will last. That very Does trauma present the same for everybody um, in terms of things like emotions, memories, and things like that? Trauma will be quite varied, but if someone is experiencing trauma, um, they, it does affect their ability to encode memories, to recall memories, um, to um, it affects their affect, which is their feelings, which is why you sometimes see people giggling or with blank affect explaining horrific things. Trauma can also affect the brain in terms of mobility, being able to, to move or to speak. Some survivors say they can't even speak, and that's often related to the most of trauma. Um, so, and it also affects the how that decision. So when people are experiencing trauma, they experience kind of a fuzzy brain, they can't really think clearly. Um, but again, the responses that people have greatly depending on the experience. So that's the while they're experiencing trauma, and then there's a the long lasting effect of trauma. And that very to some people will have anxiety, depression, intrusive thoughts, suicide, um, self-cutting. There's a lot of different ways of trauma. And for some people it's short term, and for other people it lasts for in terms of you mentioned kind of the, the fuzzy brain and decision making, have you seen in your in your work in affecting actual memory and the ability to recall specific even traumatic events? Yes, and so that's why law enforcement and other service providers, including advocates, are um, trained in um, how to interview um, in a trauma informed way, um, so that there's open ended questions, pace, and there's certain strategies that are used to help unlock the memory. And um, see, if people are recalling traumatic events. They often don't recall the detail sequentially. Um, there might be gaps in their memory. Sometimes they remember some details one day. Other days they remember other details. Um, so it's important to understand the effects of trauma on, on memory and recall and to help people unlock them. We started kind of this whole testimony off with what your expertise is. And one of the things you talked about was non-intuitive victim behaviors. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so non-intuitive means it doesn't make sense. So for instance, if somebody is being abused, people who either haven't been abused or have been trained on the topic or work in the field like I do, would just think it's just easy to leave. Why don't they just leave? Um, when in fact it's very difficult to leave, there's a lot of factors that keep people staying in abusive relationships and going back. Um, and so that's an example of an opportunity. Let's talk about that specifically um, before we talk about a few other of the non-intuitive behaviors, reasons why, and I'm going to say why women stay, but men men are also victims in these relationships, as you've seen, correct? correct. But let's talk about specifically here why in, an, in a domestic violence relationship, why you have seen some of the reasons why women have expressed staying in a relationship. What are some of the things that you have seen some of the quote unquote reasons? So in, in, in a healthy relationship, if you decide it's over, the other party usually can be disappointed or sad that they will accept it. But when you tell an abusive person that the relationship is over, they're not going to accept it. And so it's not safe. The abuse doesn't end at the time that a victim says, I want out of this relationship. Um, it's an increased dangerous time for the survivors. They often are stalked. 
They often are charmed with lies and promises to them. Again, if they're threatened, their children or pets or other loved ones are put at risk. So, so, so sometimes it's related to safety. It's often related to reasons because in an abusive relationship, even if there's not a lot of money in the relationship, uh, I'm an abusive party is going to want to make sure that the victim suffers financially. If they leave, so they control that and they aren't that, they're going to do that. So there's finances, there's safety reasons, there's love. You know, victims love the uh, abuser. And when the relationship first starts, a lot of times it's really good. Um, that might be short-lived, a few days or weeks or months, but victims want it to go back to the, what it was like in the beginning. Um, and they are optimistic and hopeful that the person will change. It's also sometimes safer for a victim to just get back with the person than to live their life separately when they are always looking over their shoulders, worrying about being broken in and called night being assaulted, kids being kidnapped from school or daycare. Um, and so sometimes it just feels safer to go back. There's also community and family pressure to go back sometimes. So it's hard. Um, a lot of the support people that they would have if they weren't being abused are cut off during the abuse, and all they have left is you know, the assailant's family or the abuser's family and other people that they have relationships with that make pressure victims to say that. So there's lots of reasons. And you talked about isolation as a particular, you know, perpetrator tactic. Um, can that also play into a role that I, the sense of a victim being isolated away from a support system? Yeah, so there's, um, and there's different types of isolation. isolation. There's physical isolation where an abuser will actually move someone to a different community or a different state or to a rural area where there's not a lot of transportation or access to people miles down the road. Um, so there's the physical isolation. Um, and then there's the emotional isolation. And every time um, a victim wants to call a sister or a friend or go be with their family or just go out, the abuser will become very abusive and jealous and it's easier to just stay home and not have contact. So that's more psychological isolation. Um, and then also if, if survivors want to go meet people, a lot of times abusers will go and remove them from that party or that social situation or embarrass them um, or create a scene where people are, other people are put in harm's way. So there's lots of reasons why survivors end up being isolated, but it's usually related to multiple tactics that the abuser uses to them. In terms of seeing, seeing the reason sometimes abused parties stay, do you see the same with them returning to the relationship? Yes. Okay. And in terms of that, do you also see any sort, do you see the a commonality with these abused persons um, delaying in disclosure or not disclosing at all these the, the abuses that they're suffering? Yeah, most uh, survivors do not share what they're experiencing because they um, know if they tell other people, people will say, um, and, or they might contact the abuser in an unsafe situation. So um, I wanted to differentiate disclosures from reporting. And so sometimes they might have a close friend or someone that needs to know about what they're going through. Um, but then there's reporting, and that's more official according to authority, like law enforcement, child care services, prosecutor's offices, things like that. Um, and so a lot of people might disclose to a few people, but usually many, many survivors never. Thank you for that. One moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Thank you. No further questions. Cross examination. Very briefly, Your Honor. Unless you want the exit, sorry. Good afternoon. Um, is it fair to say that uh, your testimony today has been, um, I don't want to say primarily theoretical, but it's not based on any interviews with any of the uh, victims in this case, correct? That's correct. It's all that general testimony versus case specific. So okay. Okay. And so when you say versus case specific, that means you haven't interviewed or talked to anyone involved in this case, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. No further questions. No further questions. Thank you, thank you ma'am. We are back on the record in the case of the people of the state of Michigan versus Williams. And Mr. Williams is still present in his cell. The record should reflect. Um, and the videos, I, video and audio, as I had explained before, is still operational for him. All right. Madam Prosecutor, you may call your next witness. Please look forward to be smart.
Sorry, I'm sorry. 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 State your person last name and spell it for the record, please. Uh, Daniel Iverson, D A N I V E R S O. Main choir. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Iverson, how are you currently employed? Currently employed with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. How long have you been there? Uh, 16 months now. Oh, where were you previously employed? For the uh, previous 29 and a half years, I was a sworn police officer in the state of Michigan, 26 and a half of those with the Ann Arbor Police Department. Of those 12, 13 years as a major crimes detective. Okay. As a major crimes detective for the Ann Arbor Police Department, were you what what is referred to as an officer in charge of the case that we are here for in court today, Alyssa Williams uh, and the defendant Isaiah Williams? Yes. When did you take over as the officer in charge of this case? Uh, sometime in the spring of 2011. Who was the previous uh, detective or detectives on this case? Uh, originally was assigned to Detective uh, William Canada in 1983 through 1987. Then there was Detective uh, Seyfried, and then uh, Detective Caldwell, and then it uh, languished in uh, historical open cases for several years where I received a training And did you remain as the officer in charge of the case from 2011 until the point at which it was charged and you left the department? Yes. Okay. And in terms of taking over a case of this magnitude, a cold case, as it were, what is one of the first things that you did? First thing I did is why I wanted to gather all the information I could to collaborate the original police reports that were in existence and track those down. That required me to go into the archives in the Inner Police Department, try to gather as much information as I could, also required me to go to the courthouse and see what records were still available. It also required me to contact all the previous detectives in the, in the case we will have any contact with it to gather more information that might not have been captured in those original police reports. As far as the police reports, um, starting back in 1983, were you able to recover those pre police reports from the archives and review all of those? Yes. As far as speaking to the previous detectives, were you able to do that as well? Yeah. Okay, tell us why. Uh, Sergeant Bill Canada passed away probably within two years of his retirement before I was a member of the police department. Uh, I tried to track down his uh, frequent partner, who was also, I believe, his relative. He'd also passed away. Uh, I tried to talk to all the detectives in the 1980s. I found one or two that were not primary involved, primarily involved with the case, but had bits and pieces from their memory about it. Were you able to at least review all of these detectives' old reports, their interviews, et cetera, to be able to bring yourself up to speed on what they had done in the investigation? Yes, I was. You had indicated in terms of uh, interviewing witnesses, did you interview um, all the living witnesses that you could in this case? Yes. Did that include Mr. Williams' siblings in this case? Yes. Betty Peters was one of those siblings. She testified yesterday. Did you interview her? Yes. Um, Denise Frazier Daniel was uh, one of the people that testified yesterday. Did you interview her? Yes. What about Elizabeth Reese and her children? Yes. Attorney Molly Reno? Yes. What about Mary Leslie Bryant? Yes. Um, one of the names that had come up in the investigation was a Diane Taylor that Miss um, uh, Frazier Daniel had said she would, lived with when she was separated from the defendant in the state of Ohio. Were you able to interview her? Tell me why not. Uh, after an exhaustive search, checking various uh, internet databases and information, uh, last known location of her was in uh, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, where it was uh, possibly at a homeless shelter. Uh, contact with them indicated she had passed away. When you were reviewing Sergeant Canada, his initial investigation, um, can you tell us, was there an investigation done as far as efforts to locate Olisa Williams alive at that time? Yes. Were there efforts at that time to locate Olisa Williams deceased in terms of identifying remains at that time? Yes. Were there remains um, from a baby in the fall of 1982 from New York? Yes. Can you speak a little bit about that and whether that was fruitful in the investigation? Uh, from the record, Sergeant Canada had come out of the uh, about this case looking for any unidentified uh, remains, human remains that matched Elisa's physical. He had gone out and contacted her uh, medical facility where Elisa was seen and got her pipe weight and information entered it into the database at that time. He was in contact by a detective at the New York City Police Department because they had recovered a uh, small female child who matched, somewhat matched the demographics of Elisa. 
that shoots down 40 in the Hudson River. From my review of the police reports, there was someone seen dumping that body, uh, an African American female. But uh, it turns out the photographs were then sent to him through the US Postal System, taking weeks to get there. He then reviewed those photos with uh, Denise and with Elizabeth Reese, and they both indicated it was not what we said. Okay. Um, and you indicated he had followed up with some medical chart information for Lisa, and, and did that match her physical measurements either? No. Okay. You indicated you had reviewed all the Ann Arbor Police Departments. Are there other department police reports that you reviewed in this case? Yes. Can you tell us about some of those? Well, I thought it was important to have a criminal investigation to establish a timeline of the offenders, um, locations, and behaviors. So I went about a quest of looking at every single police department that had ever had contact with Isaiah Williams in the United States. It's quite a vast network of agencies, but many departments throughout Illinois and Ohio and Michigan had contact with him through the years of 1981 through present day. And in terms of reviewing them, did you also obtain them and put them in your file as part of the discovery in this case? Yes, I did. Okay. You talked about court records. What court records did you ultimately obtain and review in this case? Uh, I obtained uh, circuit court records from Washington County, also from a uh, briefly testified in the wrongful death suit of his son, Isaiah, in a car accident. Obtained that also. In part of obtaining these records, are you trying to, to do anything with respect to your interviews of, of different witnesses that you've been interviewing? Well, one of the main points, this seems such a unusual allegation uh, that one had been in our historical archives for so long as an open case, I thought it was important to collaborate as much as I could possibly of what the witnesses had been had already said and what they were currently going to be saying. Two of the specific uh, pieces of exhibits that have already been admitted and Judge, these were admitted as part of exhibits, I believe 23 through 55 already. Um, you know, as part of four documents, there were two arrest cards in this matter, one from the Inkster Police Department in 1982. Um, another one is the arrest card. I've redacted some of it to um, take out portions I did not think were relevant to our case or to Elizabeth Reese's case. Or to me. May I approach your honor? You may. These are people's exhibits 33, Detective Iverson, and 42. Do you recognize these documents? What is 33? Uh, this is an arrest card from the, uh, looks like, Kingston Police Department. Okay, and did you discuss a September 1982 uh, alleged assault in the city of Inkster with Denise Frazier Daniel? Yes, I did. Okay, is that card reflect an arrest with respect to that assault? Yes. Did you also obtain a police report with respect to that assault? Yes, I did. Okay, what about uh, People's Exhibit 42? Is that also what's commonly referred as an arrest card? Yes. What are some of the things? Well, let me ask it this way. Is there contempt proceedings that are reflected on there as far as arrests for Mr. Isaiah Williams? Yes. Um, did you review the court documents in this matter from the Washtenaw County Family Court? Yes. Were there uh, contempt proceedings with respect to Isaiah Williams in February of 1983? Yes. Did those arrests corroborate that? Yes, it did. Um, was there also an arrest in 1984 with respect to um, an alleged assault from Elizabeth Reese that Mr. Williams was ultimately convicted of? Yes. Okay. One of the also the things that um, I believe that you looked into are, are tips. Did you know approximately how many tips the department has garnered from 1982 and forward on this case? Uh, I remember uh, placing on an Excel spreadsheet, but the exact number, I think it was close to 100. And, and did any of those tips from the public ever produce any um, viable information with respect to Olisa Williams being found alive or deceased? Yeah. Okay. Um, you talked already about reviewing the investigation for a deceased baby and remains from fall of 1982 in New York. Did you yourself, were you involved with some potential people who came forward um, claiming to be Olisa Williams that ultimately did not end up being her? Yes. 
Yes, I am. Okay. Do you recall a person by the name of Keisha and the last name being P-A-L-A-G-E? Yes. Can you tell us about that? We had contacted the uh, police department after seeing an age progression image on the National Center for Missing Age Prevention website. She was that person. So uh, I investigated her back, got additional information from her, contacted her family members, which I was able to obtain through independent resources, and contacted her sibling, I think her mother specifically, and got details. Okay. Was her DNA ultimately obtained um, compared with Denise and it was not, not Miss Plage or Plage? I'm not sure if I'm correct. Okay. Was there also a, a person by the name of Cyrell, S-Y-R-E-L-L, Nunali, N-U-N-N-A-L-L-Y, a 2021 tip? Yes, that's the one I, I thought. Sorry, I confused those okay. names. I contacted that last second tip her mother and her family members. Did we? Did you con confirm, excuse me, through a birth certificate that she was not Alyssa Williams? Yes. Okay. Did you also confirm through her, her biological family that she was not Alyssa Williams? Okay. Are CPS records also records that you reviewed and obtained in, in this matter? Yes. Was that also part of, of this, this corroboration that we're talking about with talking to Denise Frazier Daniel? And Elizabeth Reese. Yes. Okay. You also interviewed someone by the name of Mary Leslie Bryant. Did you obtain documents in this matter with respect to Miss Leslie Bryant? Yes. What were those documents? Miss Bryant had had kept her own records in a file. She was uh, she expressed to me how frightened she was of Mr. Williams and had kept this information because she wanted to make sure her. Open investigation since the end of the there was a warrant at the time for his arrest. She wanted to keep those records in case he was ever arrested. Proof. We've talked about your investigation and the department's investigation um, into uh, Olissa and potential unidentified remains. You heard Sarah Krabs testify today, correct? Yes. Was she the inspector? I think she was not an inspector at the time, but was she one of the officers you worked with in trying to identify um, remains that could have been potentially belonging to Alyssa Williams? Yes. Did that ever, uh, was that ever fruitful in finding Alyssa Williams? Mm -hmm. Did you also look into the possibility of Alyssa being alive? Yes. Okay. Um, what kind of things did you look into to see if Alyssa could have been alive? When I contacted the, Mr. Williams' siblings, there was always a working theory that he had somehow uh, placed her with relatives out of state. So I spent a significant amount of time contacting these relatives and distant relatives and seeing if anyone was in the truth of that. I was able to locate some distant relatives of his in Alabama, and everyone indicated that they didn't even really know him at all. Could not there was a uh... In, in you were sitting here during the testimony, I know you reviewed the documents. Uh, Sherfield or Sherfeld, Alabama, in the affidavit, did you follow up on that particular city? Yes, there was, there was discussions uh, in the reports that perhaps he had gotten an appointment there with the municipality of Sheffield, Alabama. So I contacted the captain of Sheffield, Alabama Police Department, asked him to check the human resources records for that. He later contacted me and said he had checked their records all the way back to that time period. Okay. Were you able to ever check um, any tax records or student loan documents against um, the information that you had, Olisa Williams, to see if anything had been opened up under her information? Yeah, I, I contacted the United States Secretary, I'm sorry, Social Security Administration Office of Inspector General, I also contacted the U.S. Department of Education Office of Inspector General, requested they uh, try to attempt to locate her for her Social Security number. Any usage, they both indicated there was no ever any record of a student loan or a tax return filed in her name. Also, subsequently found out that because she was missing as a child, her birth certificate and her social security number had been flagged in the system, and no one had ever inquired on it or had uh, used those. In terms of, I know that you reviewed the documents in this case, both court and police report and interviewed witnesses. Uh, were you provided with Mr. Williams' statement about an alleged abduction in Island Park in Ann Arbor? Can you tell us what Island Park is? Can you tell us a little bit about Island Park? So Island Park is located just on the north side of the University of Michigan Hospital. 
uh, off of Maiden Lane. It's about a six and a half acre uh, park. It has the Huron River that runs through it. One acre of that six and a half acres is a little island. It has a Greek um, statue. I mean, uh, it's only got like a pavilion. Perfect. You go to. There are two parking lots there. There's a lower parking lot and an upper parking lot. As you travel east through the park, there's one park parking lot and then a higher one above. So upper and lower parking. Is there a body of water in that park? Yeah, the Huron River a branch that runs through that. Do, do you know whether um, any department has ever searched the Huron River, whether it was 1982 or present date? Um, I talked to a detective who, who said she recalled in that time period that they had drudged the Huron River, but I could never collaborate with that with any <laughs> I also contacted the U.S. Coast Guard because of the currents flowing down to Lake Huron. Anything that had ever been recovered led me to also contact the Ohio jurisdictions along that uh, pathway and the Canadian side of the board to see if her remains had ever been recovered. And no, she, she never recovered. In reviewing the court documents, specifically the affidavit, one of the affidavits filed by Mr. Williams' attorney, um, was there information provided in there that the defendant had been living during the specific time period of 1982 with family in the city of Ann Arbor? Yes. And that he also had been residing temporarily at a motel in the city of Ann Arbor. Yes. Did the doc say, that same document we're talking about indicate that he had gone to Alabama uh, in July of 1982? Yes. And that's the investigation that you did in following up on that particular fact in this case. Have you interviewed the defendant, Isaiah Williams, multiple times in this case? Yes. Okay, let's talk about a couple of those interviews. Um, was he interviewed also by your predecessor, Sergeant Canada? And did you review the statements with respect to that? Yes. Okay. Did that include the, the statement about the abduction at Island Park, if you know? I believe that it's like the candidate in front of them with that information that you provided. Was there any other information that you're aware of that was provided to Sergeant Canada at that time? Okay. Let's talk about February 20th, 2014. Was that your first time, to the best of your memory, that you interviewed Isaiah Williams? Yes. Okay. Um, where was that interview? Where did that take place? At the Mr. Williams residence inside the city of Detroit. Was Mr. Williams at his home in custody or out of custody? Okay. Was he free to leave? Yes. Was he free to refuse to talk to you? Yes. Okay. Um, tell me about that conversation. Finally, my purpose was going to his residence um, to ask him and make sure I had, from what I had learned from the other people that he had contact with is oftentimes he would be very agitated about child support issues. So I wanted to make it perfectly clear when I went there to him that I was not there to try to collect any child support or anything like that. We just needed to find answers where whatever happened to Elisa. Okay. Did Mr. Williams indicate um, that he had um, any knowledge about Elisa? So he never heard of her, didn't know her. Okay. Um, when he, did he indicate whether he knew someone by the name of Denise or Denise Williams or Denise Frazier Daniel? So he didn't know her. Okay. Um, did he indicate to you um, anything about his memory? Yeah, he said that, uh, 2014, in November 2014, he said that uh, he had been at a bar and the bartender had spiked his drink. He had drove away, crashed his car, and sustained uh, closed head injury, and he had no memories of his life before 1995 when the traffic accident happened. Okay. Not at all. So he indicated to you that this was from a car accident. Correct. And at that time, did he indicate to you anything um, that the head injury was due to a poisoning? Did he indicate to you at that time it was due to anything that had happened to him in prison that something had been implanted in his head? Uh, he said he had no memory of his prison 10 years back in prison at all. Okay. Did you ask Mr. Williams at that time if he had taken Alyssa Williams to the state of Alabama? What did he indicate to you? Because he didn't know her. And he would uh, get kind of agitated and say, how, how would I take you? But I don't know. I don't know. Um, at that time, if you asked him about his his years in prison and he indicated he didn't have any memory of that, did he indicate whether he had any memories of the, the decade of the 1980s? So he had no memory of the 1980s. Um, did he talk to you at all about 
brain control and anything like that. Do you recall him talking to you about that? Yeah, he did mention that uh, he believed the police could involve themselves in mind control. And he had written letters to various senators, I think it was, on that issue. After this interview, did you invite or talk to Mr. Williams about possibly interviewing him and speaking with him again? Yeah, Mr. Williams had expressed that he had traveled back from Alabama and requested this doctor uh, to help him jog his memory of his life before the traffic crash. So that gave me an opportunity to express to him that I had developed some timeline in his life that could help him with that. I invited him to attend the station and I would be willing to drive to the residence to help him with that. Was he receptive to that? Um, would he commit to meeting with you again? Before your next interview with Mr. Williams, did you make efforts at that time to follow up on some information uh, about a clinic or, or organization in Alabama? He mentioned that he had traveled to Alabama to go to the uh, Alabama, Alabama Brain Institute, I think it was, uh, for treatment. And that's where he had met the doctor who had referred him to you know, eventually get treatment and come back to Michigan that would help him with his memory. Did you contact, the, I think it's the Alabama, does the head Institute sound right? Yes. Sir. Okay. Did you contact, contact that organization? Yes. Sir. Were you able to confirm whether they were a treatment organization? You know, they were purely advocacy. Okay. Um, this advocacy organization, did they do any medical treatment at all? No. Um, this medical or this advocacy organization, did they require any medical documentation to allow Isaiah into their program? And you confirm that with the, the, the Institute? Yep, I talked directly to a person who knew him. He was there and had just received a referral for his records to go to Detroit. Was that Debbie Dean? Yes, it was. Um, March 1st, 2014. Um, does that sound correct as to the next date you tried to speak with Mr. Williams? Yes. Okay. At that time, uh, where do you recall trying to speak with him at? Uh, during our February of 2014, he had um, expressed how busy he was and he was putting to us his calendar. And I noticed it was only except for one tennis appointment at the University of Michigan Dental School here in Ann Arbor. So, myself and the Texas. It appears uh, on that date you made uh, two separate attempts to talk to Mr. Isaiah Williams on that date. Yes. Tell me, were you successful in speaking with him? Yes. Okay, tell me what, uh, what if anything, was said. He said he, he had no memory, but he might be able to recall something if I were able to produce some kind of court documents related to the identity of Denise, Fraser Daniels, and Denise Harris, as she was known before his marriage. And so uh, I did know why we were there. He became... He started sweating profusely. He had nervous and fidgety, and his voice got raised with us. Most likely, he was trying to make his team in front of everybody. And so we left and then went to back to the station, retrieved the court documents that he kind of outlined what he'd like to see. And we came back around 10, 15 or so. Did he want to see those documents when you came back with them? Yes. Okay, did he look at those documents? Yep. He sat down, looked at them, we gave him plenty of space, and we sat there and watched him for about 15 minutes read over the documents. Okay, and did you proceed to ask him a series of questions then? Yes. Did he answer those? Yes. Did he have any memory at that point? Uh, he claimed he had no memory, he did not know who I was even talking about. During this particular interview in March, um, was Mr. Williams, in your opinion, cooperative with answering your questions? Yeah. Okay. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Was was he evading you in any way? He would never answer questions directly. He was evasive. And when I pointed it out to him, he got more agitated and started causing more of a scene. Fast forward to the year 2021. Um, did you have the occasion to go see Mr. Williams in the city of Chicago? Okay. Can you tell me why it is that you went to Chicago? It was another attempt to see if we could generate any leads as to what happened to Lisa. An opportunity for him to tell us if the more time had passed, he might be more active to talk to us about it. Was he living there at the time? Yes. Okay, so where is it that you ultimately had this interview with Mr. Williams in Chicago? No, Mr. Williams at 501 North Central in Chicago. It's a, a four-story former YMCA, has about 300 single room 
residencies there. They all shared common bathrooms on the floors and uh, found in there. When you first began interviewing Mr. Williams, did he indicate this time whether he had any memory of, of the particular people you were asking about? No okay. What was his reasoning um, on this particular occasion for his lack of memory? He said that he had been poisoned. Is, the person that affected his memory, he had no memory of his life before it's poisoned. Is this the first time he brought up the poisoning to you? Did he bring up the car accident to you this time? I don't believe he did it this time. He did it personally. <laughs> Uh, when you brought up the subject of Olisa Williams, um, what was his demeanor? How did he act? Well, I found it interesting. We had spent several minutes there with him and he had he even asked why I was there. So I told him that we were there to talk about what would happen to Olisa Williams. He then got really nervous and uh, started straightening things up in his, his little apartment and seemed to get kind of agitated and nervous about it. And so we we said we had I was there with another detective, uh, Dave Jenkins, and we were I expressed to him we had information that might help him with his memory, since he didn't remember Denise or Liz Reese or anything. So I produced his uh, wedding marriage license. How did he react when you showed him his marriage license to Denise? He seemed to look at it for a significant amount of time. It was kind of awkward, and then he eventually said that uh, that signature had been forged. So he denied the signature and the marriage license was even his. Right. He had didn't, did he say he did not even remember the marriage initially? Yes, he did. But then denied the signature was his. Did you ask him about Mary Leslie Bryant? Yes. Did he claim whether he remembered her or not? No, he didn't remember her at all. Did you ask him about his time in prison in the 80s? I didn't. Did you bring up his prior statement about this this alleged abduction um, in the city of Ann Arbor that he had told Judge Campbell about in Washtenaw County. Yes, sir. What was his response to that? Doesn't remember any of that. Did you bring up the topic you've mentioned before that that you didn't want to bring up in your first interview, child support? Did you bring it up this time? No, he did. Okay, tell me about that. Uh, he was talking about some woman had uh, gone to court and and the child, children with her and so forth. And I think I'm going to ask, clarify your questions about who we met. So it was a list woman named Liz, and we discussed his kids then, yeah. Um, what was his demeanor or emotional state when he was talking about this, about the child support and being taken to court for child support? He got agitated because he was claiming that child support was still being done for social security disability check every month, and that was really a source of a contention for him. <laughs> when talking about Olisa and Denise, did he indicate at any time that, that you should bring Denise to him? Yes. Tell me about that. He said he might be able to help me if I just brought Denise to him so he could talk to her and see if he would never hear that. Okay. So he made this request that you should bring Denise Frazier Daniel to him. Right. Okay. Um, at the end of the interview, when you were talking about child support again, how did he react to this and how did the interview ultimately end? And when we, talk, we were talking about that, he got so agitated, he told us to leave. Okay. Yeah. And did you do that? Yes. Okay. Um, this, this interview, was he out of custody? Yes. Was he free to come and go as he pleased? Yes. Okay. Was this interview captured on body cam footage? Yes, it was. Okay. You've talked about this statement that he first gave you about this um, brain injury being from a car accident. Then you said in 2021, he mentioned a poisoning. Um, he never mentioned a chip in prison being implanted in his head to the best of your memory. Okay. You, you heard some of the testimony in court, correct? From the children. Okay. And sitting here today, you don't have any memory of that. After you visited Isaiah Williams, um, did you learn who his emergency contact was at that time? Yeah, in May of 21, yeah. the uh, Plaza Arms had listed his place of residence as his son was Scotty Williams was his emergency contact. Okay, and did you in turn then go interview Mr. Scotty Williams? Yes. Okay. Uh, as part of your investigation, did you investigate this this claim by Mr. Williams that he has this close head injury and therefore lacks sufficient memory to remember his life or any of the people in it. Yes, okay. You've already talked about 
going to the Alabama or talking to the Alabama Head Institute? Um, did you take statements from his ex-wives and his children? Yes. Was that in an effort to sort of try to get information about this alleged brain injury? Right. Um, did you also obtain some medical records in this case? Yes, Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Detective Iverson, I am approaching with People's 57 and 50, People's Proposed 58. Can you tell me if you recognize Proposed 57? Yes, I do. What is 57? These are medical records from the St. Joe Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor that did research work. And what about Exhibit 58? These are medical records pertaining to Isaiah Williams from the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. Is that for a, a two-year period of time, I believe 1995 to 1997? Yes, it is. Um, you obtained both sets of those medical records, correct? Yes. And you have reviewed those records thoroughly in your investigation of his alleged brain injury and lack of memory. Yes. Your Honor, I would ask that people 57 and 58 be admitted. Any objection? No objection. 57, 58 are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's talk about first the medical records for 57, the St. Joseph medical records. Um, those records indicate they are from February 10th, 1994 to February 11th, 1994, correct? Mm -hmm. What is the, the subject or the reason from the best of your memory on why Mr. Williams was being treated at that time? Those records collaborated the information that Mr. Williams had shared with us in February of 2014 that uh, this car accident he claimed to have been involved in. He, later in our interview on the February 2014, towards the end of it, I asked for if he had any records because he had a large briefcase full of documents similar to the one brought into court, if he had perhaps his traffic crash report. He then produced one to us from the February 1994. Were you able to, in those records, see uh, one note of a, a self-report of a of a head injury in the in that record. Yes. Was there any um, information in the totality of those records of any follow-up uh, testing sent to any neurologist or anything of that 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 like? Um, was there a CT of the uh, brain that was in that rec in those records? Yes. Did anything come back unusual or abnormal in that CT scan that you saw? Was there a CT of the head in those records as well? Yes. Was that negative? Was there neuro checks that were completed and that were documented in those records? Yes. Were those normal or abnormal? Normal. Okay. Was there anything in those records? Well, let me ask this. Um, does it indicate in there that he was released to a relative, like a sibling? Yes. Okay. Is there anything in those records from St. Joseph Hospital that indicates Mr. Williams left that hospital exhibiting lack of memory, memory loss, or amnesia? Um, was there a doctor that you ultimately followed up with from those records and did a, did an interview with? Yes. Okay, who was that? I've had to refer my report. Okay, if I, if if I refresh your memory with Doctor Cropsey, Cropsey? Yeah. Yes. okay, does that sound familiar to you? Yes. Um, was there any information you were ever provided that there was a follow up neurological exam or anything like that that was uh, ordered by Doctor Cropsey? Yeah. Okay. As far as the Ohio records. Um, the records from 1995 to 1997, um, there's indications in there that Mr. Williams indicates he had been in a car accident, correct? Okay. What kind of injuries are reported by Mr. Williams or symptoms of injuries does he report in those records? It's almost exclusively for a back injury. Okay. Um, did you review one 1995 November PT record where he reports a closed head injury. Yes, sir. Is there anything else in those records by way of neurological exams for a closed head injury? Is there anything in there reflecting that Mr. Williams had reported amnesia or lack of memory about who he was? Okay. One moment, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you, Detective Ivers. Cross examination. Good afternoon. So uh, is it fair to say that the checks and the investigations that you did on the birth certificate and the social security number, all of that was done basically searching the name Olisa Smith, correct? Olisa Williams with her name. Olisa mean, Williams. And also with social security. Right. So you weren't using any other name 
or any other social security numbers or any other dates of birth, correct? No. So if Elisa Williams assumed a different name and a different social security number, your investigation wouldn't have shown that, correct? Okay. And you said that you could not find anybody to corroborate that back in 82, 83, that the Huron River had been dredged at that time, correct? Yeah. Okay. And um, the police reports and the arrest records and everything you research, none of them showed any child abuse or any violent actions towards a child, correct? As it relates to Mr. Williams. Well, I mean, there were domestic violent incidents, correct? With right. his spouses and ex-girlfriends. Right, there was one of his children from his current, well, his last marriage, there was a child girl. Were they tied to Mr. Williams? Was Mr. Williams subsequently convicted and sentenced for those? They were subsequently Okay, so he was not convicted or arrested for that, correct? Okay, thank you. Just briefly. Yes. In review of those CPS records, um, who was Kimberly in the care and custody of when she sustained those injuries? Okay, and was, did CPS take action with respect to Kimberly based on those injuries? Yes. As far as any other social security or any other name, were you ever provided any of that information for Olisa Williams to be able to check into that? No. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Sir, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you. People have no further witnesses. You just would ask for a brief second to set up the computer. So All right, any witnesses for the defense? Oh, Your Honor. All right. We're going to step off a bit more. I got to make a quick phone call. She's going to set up her computer and then I'll come back. Okay. All right. We're going to be in a district court in Cali, Washington, the state of Michigan. All right. So, uh, All right. You may be seated. All right. We're back on the record in the case of the people versus Isaiah Williams. Counsel is present. Good for argument. And motion. I have everything hooked up. I think, um, I think I do. <laughs> the HDMI cord is plugged in. There. Could have done. So that. how does she not have any icons on her? Do you know that? That's not my screen. Oh, <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> I, oh, my it's like, how do you get through life? You don't. Get, there is nothing to click on. <laughs> I was going to say, my father, that's right. <laughs> Everything's there. So, who are we watching then? Um, it's just been that kind of day. It's been that kind of day. <laughs> that's my right, correct? That is the right law table. Yep. But I don't. It should broadcast. Yeah, and normally it goes black on. There, oh, there, no. there she is. No. Oh, you had to turn hers to the extern. Gotcha. All right. Well, it it's never, <laughs> has never happened to me. Video. Back to your presentation. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Dutch. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> and I think that the game case is clear. Circumstantial evidence and reasonable inferences is what we're talking about here. And it's very appropriate for the court to make those reasonable inferences from the evidence that we have. And I think that it's a very common misconception that you need a body for a murder case. And I, I'm saying that to Mr. Williams, too, wherever he's listening, because that is that is a very common misconception all across the state. All across the state. Body. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Elisa Williams. She was born August 10th, 1981. The defendant, Isaiah Williams, is her legal father, not her biological father, based on the testimony and evidence we have. She was taken on or about April 29th, 1982. She was last seen in July in the summer by multiple people in 1982 in Ann Arbor, in Michigan in Washtenaw County. She has not been seen as of Saturday, as of this past Saturday, 41 years. The evidence points to murder, that she was murdered in July. He left to go to Alabama at the end of July. She was last seen in the beginning of July. 
I did not have her when we left the state. There is probable cause that she is deceased, that she did not die of natural causes, that she died from a homicide, and that the homicide was committed by the defendant. This is one of the exhibits that was admitted. This is what decades later, Alyssa Williams would look like had she been alive, but she is not alive. The evidence points to her being very much deceased, Your Honor. Um, we are asking for a bind over on count one, the only count charged here, open murder, that Mr. Williams did murder Alyssa Williams. There is no degree that is required here under open murder. No evidence of premeditation, no deliberation required under the case law. But of course, motive is always relevant. That's why the other acts here, especially the other acts on Denise Frazier Daniel are so important. And I would submit they're not even other acts when it comes to Denise Frazier Daniel. They are part of the case in chief. They are evidence of defendant's motive, his opportunity, his premeditation, and his deliberation, even though that is not something we have to prove at this stage. Um, the case law is clear. There's prior threats, prior feelings of ill will, that deliberate action on the part of a defendant that is premeditation. Evidence of marital discord, either known to the defendant's spouse or showing the state of mind is sufficient. That was all things that came in under Denise Frazier Daniels' testimony in this case. Corpus delecti, we don't have any corpus delecti issues, even with the lack of a body. There's no corpus delecti in using this multiple statements that we've put in from the defendant. His admissions, his confessions, they are all admissible. We have circumstantial evidence of a death that was the result of a criminal act or an agency. That's the McMahon case. A body is not necessary. Again, people be Williams and people be Moldeski. Testimony of a medical examiner is not even essential or required. Whether, well, where there is competent and substantial other evidence of unnatural death or injury. Then you, the people early on in this case designated and filed documents to designate the venue here in Washtenaw County. Um, that was under MCL 762.3. Um, but let's look at the totality of circumstances that we have on this evidence. Look at the court documents that have all been admitted. Isaiah Williams, through his family court attorney, said, I temporarily, li temporarily lived on Pittsfield in Ann Arbor at a motel in Ann Arbor. There was attached copies of a driver's license with prior Ann Arbor addresses. The testimony of him in family court was that he had her in Washtenaw County in Ann Arbor um, in Island Park when she quote unquote disappeared or allegedly was abducted. This, as I submit to this court, this false abduction story. Testimony that um, from Elizabeth Reese that she was seen at a hospital in Ann Arbor and at her house. Again, we have multiple, multiple pieces of evidence that points to not only having her in the venue of Ann Arbor or venues in Washington County, but that's where he killed her. That is where he killed her and ultimate, ultimately where she met her demise. A couple cases I do want to talk about unpublished case law here in the state of Michigan upholding no body cases. In People v. Green, the Court of Appeals affirmed a first-degree murder conviction with the body of the 13-year-old victim there was never found. Uh, the victim was to meet the defendant there under false pretenses. She was last seen at a meeting place. There was a white van there. The evidence was that the defendant later replaced a white van that he had and gotten rid of some cell phone, some phone records he had. He denied knowing the victim in this case, then later admitted to a particular person that he knew where the body was, although the body was never recovered. He kept a picture of her. He admitted he had a fetish for 13 and 14 year old girls. And he admitted to an inmate awaiting trial that he was going to trial because he quote killed a girl. We know that Isaiah Williams um, telling multiple stories, but he has told multiple people that he killed this child. People v. Phillips, the Court of Appeals, also affirmed this second-degree murder conviction. This is a very, very similar case to ours, Your Honor. A body of a four-month-old never found. The defendant sent the victim's mother a letter in the case that uh, the child was now at peace, and the child was thrown from a car seat, and that's how she died. An inmate uh, there, also an inmate, where, uh, said the defendant was bragging that he wouldn't be charged with murder because they'd never find the body. Again, think back to Mary Leslie Bryant's testimony. They never found the body, and it killed the baby. It's so very similar to our case, both in that regards and the fact that in the Phillips case, he had a very tumultuous and violent relationship with the victim's mother, and the defendant was not the biological father of the victim in that case. That is a direct parallel to this, the, that lethality factor, that tactic that we have, that issue we have um, based on the expert testimony of Holly Rosen. 
All the evidence that we have, and I'm going to talk specifically some of, about some of it. The fact is, he is the last person that is seen ever with Elisa Williams alive. He makes multiple inconsistent statements. He makes false exculpatory statements, and I'm going to talk specifically about those. The false abduction story and the closed head injury. Those are false excul exculpatory statements. Court can also look and make reasonable inferences in this consciousness of guilt, right? Inferences based on his conduct, his behaviors, and his statements, gleaning from those things, reasonable inferences of the defendant's guilt. The timeline and taking of this child, his fleeing to Alabama, that is going to be a question of fact for the jury based on the jury charge. Did he flee to Alabama or did he go there for a job? I'm submitting to you he fled to Alabama after he killed this child. Elisa was a healthy child. Denise was the primary caregiver. He, she would be soiled and dirty when she left with her. Elizabeth reset when she brought him over. She was soiled and dirty. He was not the primary caregiver for this child. She has been gone as of Saturday for 41 years. And the other acts evidence, the substantial violent propensity towards women and children violence that we have here. And we're going to talk about that. Last person to see be seen with Elisa. Elizabeth Reese saw her at the hospital in Ann Arbor multiple times, then at her house. He then at the end of July takes the defendant to the bus station. No luggage, no Elisa. The defendant resided in the state of Ohio. Her, her, his mother was sick and dying based on the testimony of Liz Reese and was dead by September, by her funeral, September 2nd. Why did Isaiah Williams suddenly flee to Alabama with no luggage and no child? I would submit to the court because he had killed the child at that point. Verna Williams Anderson and Kimberly Webb are her children, her children with the defendant. They also saw that child at the house. None of these people, none of these women ever saw that child again in 41 years after the defendant left that home with that child. We're talking early July, July 9th or 10th, a couple of weeks before Verna's birthday, July 22nd, when the defendant goes to Alabama. So within a couple of weeks, she's gone, never to be seen again. Betty Peters also saw the child in the state of Michigan in Washtenaw County. She was a nurse for U of M Hospital. She also saw the child with her brother, the defendant, never saw the child. The defendant has told Denise, as well as other parties, Elisa died of a fever. That was disputed by Denise checking all the local hospitals, no record of her child dying of a fever. I gave Elisa away. But you heard from Detective Iverson that was looked into multiple ways in the investigation. Hundreds and hundreds of tips. Nobody's ever come forward with Elisa. Elisa's across the water. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but nothing really came from that. Elisa was taken from a park while I slept. This is one of those false exculpatory statements. His, the legal father who's caring for this child, she was abducted from your car and you never reported it to the police. That is inconceivable. I think it was Molly Reno that said this was incredulous. Um, and then I killed Elisa. And he said this multiple times, multiple times to police. He admitted he said this to Elizabeth Reese. He said, I told Denise this. I was just trying to torture her or mess with her. I forgot what the exact language was. Uh, but he also made this specific threat to Elizabeth. I killed a woman. I killed a baby. They never found the body. And he's doing this while he's strangling her. And he's telling her, I will kill you too. More statements that he made. Think back to that September 1982 uh, assault at the motel. City of on Denise. Come to me and I'll tell you where all this is. He has no intention of turning over that child. That child is gone by September of 1982. The charging date on the information, or on the complaint rather, is the year 1982. But I'm submitting to the court by September of 82, that child is gone. Give me money and I'll give Elisa back. Many witnesses testified money is an impetus, jealousy is an impetus for violence. Many things are an impetus for violence for this man. But that set him off to a violent assault where she had to jump from a second story window to get away. His admissions of guilt are huge here, Judge. He told Denise he killed Elisa, told Mary he killed a baby. She didn't think anything of it except her life was being threatened. She didn't even know he had children at that point. And then he threatened Elizabeth regarding her grandmother ending up like that baby. 
false exculpatory statements. And the case law is pretty clear on this judge. There's got to be, you know, at least a record. And I think we did very much make more than probable cause of a record here that the statements that he made are false in some way, even by a circumstantial nature that the false is claimed. This Island Park abduction story is false. His close head injury and lack of memory, whether you are to understand it by poisoning, car accident, or a chip implanted in his head, which I've known he said to you several times, Judge, throughout these proceedings, he has said them several times, that those are racist memories. We have to look at the totality of the circumstances, whether the statements are false under people who Jackson. The testimony at court as evidence of false statements, that's the Wackerly case. You will see from those court documents, and I know the court reviewed the exhibits already, there was a February 1st, 1983 contempt proceeding where this man testified on the record about this false abduction story. Judge Ross Campbell subsequently put him in jail for contempt of court. That tells you about the credibility of that statement. And you can use that as substantive evidence of guilt, as Wackerly and the Dandridge case. Consciousness of guilt, inference of incrimination gleaned from the words and actions of the defendant. So we've got many different versions of what happened to Alyssa. If you gave her away, stick to that story. If she died of a fever, take us to the hospital where she's at and have a funeral for her. Why are the stories continually changing? That is the inference of incrimination. The abduction story that was never reported. The admission of Alyssa that he killed her and made her body disappear. The false statements to Elizabeth about Denise, right? Where's Denise, Elizabeth asks. Oh, she's in Ohio. She's here. She's here. It's fine. We know when he goes to Alabama, he tells Elizabeth Denise has her. But we know Denise did not have that baby at that time. That's another consciousness of guilt. Where's the baby? Elisa Williams is deceased at that point. He fled to Alabama in July of 82. He did not have Elisa with him. Why did he flee? Talk about that in a moment. The story about not having any memory and his multiple reasons why he can't even keep track of how many versions about why he doesn't have a memory. What I'm going to submit to the court is he kept telling people one version. Then he told people the abduction story, but it was so ridiculous. It's so over the top that he realized nobody was believing that. Not his siblings that he was telling, not his children, not his ex-wife. That suddenly it dawned on him when he went to prison in 1984 for abusing Elizabeth Reese. Memory. I'm going to just shut it down by saying I don't remember what happened. I don't know her. I don't know you. I don't know me. The fleeing to Alabama. So he brings Elisa to Elizabeth and her daughters in early July, 9th or 10th. By the end of July, the day after Verna's birthday, he's suddenly on a bus to Alabama. The testimony of Elizabeth supports that and the statements in the affidavits all in the court documents. They are purporting to be statements of the defendant, affidavits filed by his attorney. He resided in Ohio. His mother, Elizabeth Reese, said he was very close to his mother. Why is he leaving right then when his mother is dying? He is, they have no knowledge of close family in Alabama, not Fanny Peters, not Elizabeth Reese, not Denise. And then Detective Iverson followed up on that. Nobody in Alabama had that child. Nobody was close enough for him to give that child to. And he didn't have her when he got on that bus. He didn't even have luggage. Why would he suddenly up and leave to Alabama? She was killed before he left. He only came back to Michigan because his beloved mother died and he had to attend her funeral. I would submit to the court that's the only reason he returned to Michigan where he killed Alyssa. And let's look at the criminal jury instruction 4.4. And again, this is going to be a question of fact. Should this be bound over for the jury? There's evidence that the defendant either tried to rot, run, hide, did run and hide. Um, that could be innocent, right? We all know that could be for innocent reasons. Could he have gotten a job there? The evidence supports that he did not get a job there based on Detective Iverson's testimony um, and all the circumstantial evidence. But a person may also run or hide because of consciousness of guilt. That's what I submit to the court we have here, a consciousness of guilt. He took off after killing Melissa. Melissa before was a healthy child. You saw the immunization card. She's updated on her immunizations. Denise was the primary caregiver. You, as, as the judge presiding here, can look at the credibility of Denise Frazier-Daniel on whether she was a good primary caregiver for that child. 
She was eight months old when she was taken, completely dependent on the care of the defendant who took her from her mother's arms. We are not talking about a 25-year-old woman who decided to go off to Europe and start a new life. This is a baby who is completely dependent on that man and who he too, who last had custody and control of that child. She did not go off and start a new life. He killed her. It has been 41 years. Look at the time. Timing of the taking of the child in conjunction with the testimony, the general testimony of Holly Rosen. Denise had already tried to divorce the defendant one time before. That document is in evidence. It was dismissed because the defendant could not be found to be served. Denise had already moved out. She was leaving him. She said she was intending on divorcing him. She lived with uh, Diane Taylor. The defendant had assaulted her the day before and locked her in the closet and would not let her out. CPS had to get involved because she couldn't even get back to Olisa. He was losing control of her. He takes her to punish Denise, to control Denise, to torture Denise. Uh, did he premeditate the killing at the time he took her? I don't think the court even has to look at that. He took it to control her because he wasn't controlling Denise anymore. He flees to Michigan where Denise fo follows him with filing for legal separation and to gain custody of Alyssa. So now he flees and by June she's there filing documents to tell him, I don't care what you've done. I'm still leaving you and I'm taking my kid. It's at that point that he's probably thinking about child support and the, which we know is a hot button issue with him based on the testimony and that sets him off. He has to get rid of this child. And quickly, the timeline, and I won't focus on this too much, or he's really paid very close attention to testimony. Um, but that's let's look at back in Ohio, April 29th, 1982. She's last seen in June, July of 82 in the state of Michigan. By the end of July, he's gone in Alabama and not back here until September. She was killed here in the state of Michigan. The evidence points to it happening here in Washington County. The suspect claims this claim, this disclosed head injury. I would say that there's absolutely to that. The other acts, Your Honor, this is a open murder case, yes. This is an open murder charge, yes. But make no mistake about it, it is a domestic violence case. This was his legal child, which he shared a residence with, he had shared a home with. That is a domestic violence case, and that falls within the domestic violence definition, causing, attempting harm, whether it's physical or mental, to a family member or a household member. Um, that is sexual assault, which we heard from Barry Leslie Bryant, um, terrorizing, threatening, intimidating. We heard that from multiple witnesses, but this is physical harm to his family members, the DV case. Denise's other actual specific evidence of premeditation, deliberation, motive, and intent here. Um, and the statute in which all this evidence comes in under, along with the prop case, which is the seminal case out of this, Montgomery, Brandon, et cetera, is that this man had a propensity. We can use it for propensity. He had a propensity of violence against not only women, but partners. And Kimberly, we know that the evidence is that he admitted to losing it because his child was crying and pushing her down the stairs, causing multiple broken bones. So we've got abuse on Denise, Elizabeth, Mary, and Kimberly. All of these acts happened before, contemporaneous to, and even at, after the kidnapping and killing of Melissa Williams. It's a consistent and ongoing propensity of violence by this man. Even if you consider it coming in for non-propensity purposes, the shows his intent to do what he did to Olisa, shows his opportunity, his intent, his motive. It shows that there was not a mistake here, that it was a very purposeful act, much like what he does to all the other people in his life, women specifically. It shows his confidence. Uh, I'm not going to belabor all the testimony. You've heard all the testimony of all of these women, the women that he abused, Denise Frazier Daniel, Elizabeth Reese, Mary Leslie Bryant, his children, Verna, Scotty, Kimberly. They all talked about, two of them talked about lasting Alyssa, but they all talked about this false exculpatory statement, not just of the kidnapping, but of this alleged brain injury that is just not so. Betty Peters testified. Sarah Krebs testified extensively as of last night searching for the remains. We have not found the remains that has not stopped these investigators from looking for her. Um, Dan, Dan Iverson and Holly Rosen testified as to these DV dynamics. So if there's ever any concern for anybody reading this record as to why Denise did not leave, 
or why Denise stayed or why she kept bringing this child back. I hope that those concerns would be quelled by the testimony of Holly Rosen. It also seems to put out an explanation of their, why would this man snatch up this child and kill this child? I think Holly Rosen's testimony puts out a perfectly understandable explanation. He could no longer control Denise. He took what he could control. The child that was legally his, he was on the hook for, on that birth certificate, but biologically not his. Holly said it perfectly. Batterers are no longer the center of attention. Isaiah Williams was no longer the center of attention. And so he took that child and he killed that child. The exhibits the court went through, uh, the medical records were just uh, put into evidence today, but you can see from looking at those records, um, that lack of memory, that amnesia, that is just not so. It's just not corroborated by the records. Um, the family court documents, the birth, birth records, marriage records, and all those documentations from De Denise, would those specifically show you, Judge, that in the last 41 years, she has not stopped looking for her child. She has not stopped sending the picture, the information, the social security number. So the, the idea that Alyssa could be out there alive, just living her beautiful, perfect life is inconceivable based on even just the efforts of Denise going out there and putting all this information out there. Hundreds of tips have not been fruitful. She is not out there alive. Isaiah Williams, he is born 10, 2346. He is not the biological father. He's got a propensity of violence against women. He said he killed her. That is an admission and a confession in which this court can look to and use along with all the rest of the evidence. When that was no longer working, I just don't have a number. I just can't answer your question. I just don't know who you are. Um, these are false exculpatory statements and consciousness of guilt are the material pieces of the evidence that I would ask the court to look to in this case and binding the defendant over on one count of open murder. Um, I reiterate that the lack of a body is just one factor here and one that I believe that we have sufficiently overcome beyond probable cause at this stage. Thank you. Response. I would object to the bind over um, it does include a level of premeditation that I don't think is even a question of fact here. We have heard from numerous witnesses and we have seen a number of exhibits. The only thing that was established at a probable cause standard is that Mr. Williams is a bad guy. He's done some bad things. He's been very abusive towards women. Um, he's made threats towards them, terrorized them for money. But there was no evidence or no testimony about his abusive behavior. In fact, it was the opposite. Um, Ms. Bryant testified that when the baby came over to her house, she and, the, and her two daughters took care of the baby, cleaned the baby up, did the baby's hair, took pictures. She noticed no signs of abuse. The baby didn't seem to be uncomfortable around Mr. Williams. They left. She also indicated that he had given her several stories throughout the years and she didn't believe him. No one believed him because he's known to be a liar. Liars make up multiple reasons and multiple excuses for a lot of different things. We do know that Mr. Williams was money hungry. Um, he had no problems beating up the women in his life to an attempt to get money. So who's to say he did not give his baby away to someone for some money? We don't know and nothing has been proven even at a probable cause standard. Um, if this is bound over, I think it's bound over strictly on character evidence of Mr. Williams being abusive. So because he's an abusive person, he must have abused this child. And I don't think that's a proper standard. So I will object to the bind over based on that. Just briefly, Your Honor, I yes. asked the court if the was ever, ever considering that there needed to be premeditation. Look to People v. Johnson, 427 Michigan yes. 8, 107 to 109. It's a 1986 case. He will be law, B A U P H, 243 Mission App, 1, page 7, 2000 case, no specification on an open murder charge. I would also say, as far as Mr. Uh, Williams being a liar, that is just more as consciousness of you know, he cannot keep his story straight. Where is Williams if she is alive? And if you throw out all the other acts, if you separate sitting for the day, not Denise. Denise's is part of the case in chief. I would submit to that. It's not specific to the Throw out Elizabeth Reese's abuse. 
throw up Mary Leslie Bryant's abuse. If you can, if you can separate the strangulation from the confession he gave her, which I don't think you can, it's part of the case in chief. But if you throw that out and you just look at everything else, I would submit to the court there is still the odd probable cause to believe that she died at the hands of the defendant, she died of unnatural causes of homicide, and that she is not alive. Um, Your Honor, there is no, I don't know how we can hang our hats on an infant didn't seem uncomfortable or had any bruises in the early weeks of July. Um, if that's not going to be east of that, but we do have evidence that, that he admitted to that he had a dark and really case of a similar, similar age. Well, the court, and let me just say a couple of things before giving my decision, and I, I think it worth noting, um, and I think it's important, uh, the court was listening very carefully and I guess my mom raised me a little bit different, but I'll just refer to them as Denise, Elizabeth, and Mary. And it's, um, as I listened to their testimony about what they went through, um, let me first of all say that I don't think for one moment that they were exaggerating, trying to make something that was horrible seem worse. Um, I listened very closely when they couldn't answer something specifically. They said so, but they were very specific about what they went through. Um, I've been doing this for 23, 24 years. And um, I'm always impressed, certainly, by witnesses. Um, their stories were hard to hear, certainly. But it had to be difficult for them to tell. And I don't, certainly can't think of any more credible testimony that this court has heard and any more courageous testimony. Um, particularly, I one of the, the things that was remarkable about their testimony, particularly with regard to Denise and Elizabeth, and you'll excuse me for using their first names, but um, Everything they did and what they put up with at some point was really for the protection of their children. They were almost willing to sacrifice themselves for that. It was not a hard stretch for this court to figure out why did he stay, particularly after the point in time that Elisa was born. She stayed. A lot of ways to try to protect Elise. She dealt with him because I think in her mind, and I think in terms of what she was saying, there was a great fear that he was going to do something. But if I keep in contact, if I appease him in some way, my child will be okay. Ms. Reese had the same thought process. And I don't, you know, sometimes when you're up here hearing these cases, you, your mind can't sort of hold it all, but you leave certain things behind. But um, the testimony of Ms. Reese when she was talking about being in that speeding car Not knowing what it was going to happen, what was going to happen, hoping and praying that the door wasn't going to open so she could extricate herself from that vehicle while it was moving. She knew she had to get out. And I won't forget her words. It's almost as if she wasn't really trying to save herself. But she was trying to send a message to her daughters. 
that um, I had to let him know I tried to do something. And after going through all of that, Mr. Williams, I don't know that he deserves that title. Uh, ends up hitting her in the head with a two by four as she's trying to get away. I start with their testimony because I, quite frankly, um, I realize this is a probable cause hearing. This case goes way beyond probable cause in what's just shown to me here today. And I don't I know for sure. I haven't seen it all. Um, but <sighs> a lot of cases I've seen. And I'll be honest with you, I've not seen a monster like this ever. And what he did to people. I take to heart what defense counsel is arguing that, yes, he's abusive to women. He's does this, but that he isn't necessarily abusive to children or whatever. Listening to this case as it was going on, I thought about that. And at the very beginning, that the things that Denise was describing, and then ultimately Elizabeth were describing the initial part of Miss Reese's testimony. And because he does all of these bad things, does that make him a murderer? Nothing at that point in the testimony had shown that he had necessarily done anything to a child. Okay, you hear the testimony of Elizabeth, about Elizabeth, or about Kimberly, excuse me, and what happened to her. And while I was trying to keep the date straight, and freely admit this, I had one question for the prosecutor because it didn't come up during the course of the testimony. But at the end of questioning Ms. Reese, um, she looked back regarding testimony and I, Detective Iverson knew and he knew that one thing had not come out and that was the age of the child. And then the question was asked. And I will be honest with you, I thought in my mind, maybe she's six, seven, and she's somewhere. She's two and a half. <laughs> and in somebody's care with broken bones. And that happens while that child, and he doesn't take the child to the hospital. He doesn't, he, he does nothing. It's not until Elizabeth got there, thank God. Child receives medical. I have a whole lot of feelings about the case, but not feelings that cloud my judgment as to whether or not probable cause has been established. I think probable cause regarding the charge of open murder has been clearly established by the people. And just in terms of certain facts, you're right, he couldn't have Denise. He couldn't control Denise. So what does he do? He finds her, pushes her down, and takes the one thing that she knows, he knows, is very precious to her, and he takes Alyssa. April 29th, 1982, took her. And that was a mom that never saw her daughter again. Because in this court's mind, and based upon the evidence, that poor little baby didn't make it to September of that year. Others who were mothers who came into contact with the child, Elizabeth, and they were trying to get him to go away because their intent was to try to get that baby back to his mother, her mother. 
It didn't work out. He left with the baby. Is there are these others looking to get back? Others are beginning to ask questions about this baby. They see this baby. They see the baby at the hospital. They see the baby at the home. And they know, and he's giving a story about where Denise is that doesn't make any sense, doesn't fit in with where Denise actually was. And he's just making up stories, lying about why he has the baby. Regrettably, we knew that it was going to have a tragic outcome because as evidenced by his care of Kimberly, he doesn't have the patience to be able to deal with the child. Kimberly at two and a half ends up with broken bones because she's crying. Can imagine what he must have thought of poor Lisa. And then his unexplained trip. And I recall the, the testimony very clearly because he didn't have bags. He didn't have anything. He just said he had to go to Alabama. He just left. He had to go. And he took off. No baby that he had been sort of carting around, carrying around. He also then ultimately ends up back here and people begin to question him. And again, he can't keep his life straight. And he, as his children testified to, his children that he had with Elizabeth testified to, he, when they ask, he just says, he gets agitated when they asked about Alyssa. He gets agitated and says he can't remember. Ask about the abuse, he can't remember all of those horrible things he did. He just can't remember. But yeah, that wasn't good enough. The prosecutor's right, because at some point he wants to stop being asked about it. So he feigns these various stories of implants and his chips in his head and um, some loss of memory from a car accident, which are not borne out by any medical records visits to places in Alabama to deal with that that frankly don't exist for the purposes of medical treatment. Um, and all of those things, he just keeps saying. Then as I listen to Detective Iverson, when they start to get close to him, and he's no longer really, I think, beginning to fool people because now I'm dealing with police and sometimes I don't want to talk to you. Sometimes I don't want to do this. He decides his best bet and his way of sort of sort of putting it into the questioning is to just say, not only does he not know Alyssa, what happened to her, but he doesn't know his wife, his former wife. He doesn't know any of these people. And he thinks that's going to do it for him. Um, just regrettably for him, or at least as it sit here, sits here today, uh, that didn't do it for him. Um, certainly, I could go through, I rely upon all the testimony that the court heard. I could go through all of the issues that the prosecutor has gone through regarding the consciousness of guilt. That is overwhelming here in terms of what he did, his stories. He can't even keep consistent, as the prosecutor indicated, to one story. He's making it up. It's like he's throwing these things up against the wall to see what sticks, what people will buy. Um, and that's what he was doing. The last person that he was with, that little baby Alyssa was with, was the defendant who at through right or, for right or for wrong reasons was in charge of her care. Um, and then nobody sees Alyssa at some point. He then outside of the 
consciousness of guilt of all of his lies and everything, he confesses. It is no doubt in my mind that his statements about the killing of a baby or having killed a woman and a child, having killed a baby and no, can't find them, is his confession. And so for those reasons, I, I, and I just want to make it also very clear that I don't to look at this certainly on a probable cause standard. Um, and as I've said, I think the evidence is well beyond that of probable cause that the defendant um, committed the offense of homicide against baby Alyssa um, and that he did so in the year of 1982. So for those reasons, the court would find that the people have indeed sustained their burden of proof in this case. I would find a defendant over to stay in trial on the offense of open murder. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you have a copy of the exhibit list in the PowerPoint report file? Yes, we probably should have that in there. I will also, for purposes of the record, the defendant filed numerous motions, some of which I dealt with. I have reviewed all of those motions. I would just indicate that each and every motion filed by the defendant on his own, even though he was represented by counsel, is denied so that the record is clear regarding that. Defendant having been bound over on the single count. As to the circuit court. Your Honor, acknowledge receipt of the information. Then in having waived formal reading, standing mute, court will enter a not guilty plea at this time. Pre-trial in this matter will be set. I, yes, I have. I have. Um, um, yes, in custody. So May 17th at 1.30. May 17th, 2023, 1.30. Before Judge Conlon. Bond will continue as denied. Is that in person or is that? It is likely that that will be, well. Conlon is in person. I don't know whether or not they will attempt to try to transport him or not. You might want to check with the court on that. Thank you, folks. 14A stands adjourned.